Hi, this is Mark Thomas Shaw. I'm the executive director at Contemplative Light and author of the book, Dante's Road, The Journey Home for the Modern Soul. And I wanna share some key principles from the contemplative tradition that can help provide some illumination on your path. So first, the contemplative path itself is this loosening of the self with all that entails for union with the divine, to make room. And there's this ever-present grace available to us that we call the divine indwelling. And we taste it to the extent we let go of the trappings of the false self, of our over-identification with family, tribe, nation. And in so doing, we recognize the ways we're acting out of our conditioning. And it's here the ego begins to be dismantled. So from the perspective of spirit, though, this process is an awakening into life. Now, the big problem is, is even people of faith, we tend to frame our spiritual lives mostly in terms of our will, our commitment to moral choices at the surface layer. And we're mostly not even aware of the unconscious components of our ego that go into our definitions of what do and do not constitute those moral choices. We stay blind to sort of the infrastructure that makes up our mental and psycho-spiritual lives. And as long as we're convinced we're on the side of the righteous, we don't need to look under the hood all that much. But Christ put it this way, except a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it abides by itself alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So there's this invitation to die to ourselves and allow the true self to emerge. Now, from a contemplative perspective, what we die to is this construct that Thomas Merton called our false self, this identity we develop to meet our instinctual needs. And the discipline is to recognize our inner patterns of thought, emotion, reaction, to be able to let go so the spirit can manifest more clearly within. So the contemplative path doesn't preclude us from difficult situations, from hard choices, but it changes the ground of our motivation when we make those choices. Thomas Keating writes about these three siblings and their different stages on the contemplative journey, which are conventionally called the purgative, the illuminative, and the unitive. So Jesus is in the house and Martha's frustrated because she's preoccupied with her practical concerns at this purgative stage, still becoming aware of how her unconscious needs affect her everyday life, still fairly narrowly focused on her egocentric concerns. And then comes Mary, who's sitting at his feet, who's in this illuminative stage, sitting attentive to the divine presence, receptive, open, free, willing to learn. And then there's this other sibling, another stage, and it's Lazarus, who experiences this final radical relinquishment in death. And then he's called forth by Jesus back from the grave. And that's this unitive stage where there's this handing over of all our faculties in relationship to the divine presence. Now we still have to make hard decisions, but they're motivated by love, gratitude, and our situation seen through the eye of grace, not clinging, not expecting, without fear. And in that state, we have clarity, we have discernment, that hazy fog of insularity is gone. Anthony DeMello says, there's nothing in the world so clear-sighted as love. And that's the contemplative journey. There's this kind of baptism in silence, this new way of seeing and knowing and understanding, this shift in perspective, because there's been a shift in the very ground of our being. So we invite you to a practice. Maybe get up 20 minutes earlier if you have others in the house. Sit in silence with the intention to invite and rest in the presence of God. And in the silence, we recognize thoughts as they come. And when we, when we do, we introduce a sacred word to signal our consent to the presence and action of God within. Now that's centering prayer. You may have a different practice. In this practice, what word do you choose? Well, uh, I follow the anonymous author of the, the Cloud of Unknowing and simply choose the word God um, ever so gently and then return to the silence and rest there. And in that silence, this excavation takes place and we understand the need to die to that false self. And then that bleeds over into everyday life. And we, we maintain this kind of constant vigilance and alertness for when the ego bubbles up. So all the major faith traditions at their core agree there's something distorted about the human condition. And in this space, there's this realignment that takes place inside the normal issues of desire, hunger, attachment. 
And so we draw ever closer to that divine embrace and recognize our inmost self as partaking of the divine nature. And that's the experience described by the mystics stretching back from Dionysius to, to modern teachers like uh, Father Keating and Richard Rohr. So there are two key points to keep in mind. One, the path to freedom is through practice and direct experience, not just teaching, which can serve as a reminder and a pointer, but is not itself transformational. No one can awaken for you. You have to walk this path yourself. All of the teaching, there's so many fingers pointing to the moon, but it's this metanoia, this turning toward the moon ourselves that brings about inner freedom. So even in the Christian contemplative tradition, the contemplative prayer is always a grace. It's God's action that we consent to. We open the door to it that's usually closed off from our ego and our incessant thought patterns that we usually identify with. And then that begins to unravel this illusion that it's all about us. It's all about achieving something. And now instead, it becomes about this quiet consent, this intention to open ourselves to the presence and action that's always already on offer in the silence and still space. And as we let go of that stream of thought, we make room for presence and we simply dwell in that and recognize the divine nature indwelling within. And as we grow in that, we move outward. We want to connect with that, not just in the quiet time of contemplative prayer, whatever you practice, but we want to connect with it through our day, through our actions, our relationships. And how this unfolds in practice is allowing for a great clarity. That's what light provides, after all. Now, with some insight into our own dynamics, we're able to see the emotional dynamics at work. And how do we tend to respond to situations? How do we tend to want to get out of them? What makes us angry? What gives us anxiety? Where does that come from internally? And how does it manifest externally? And we're able to see those dynamics at work as if from the outside. And this is the shift in awareness that the contemplative dimension provides. It's like this muscle we strengthen with ongoing practice, usually 20 minutes twice a day. We feel this much greater sense of agency over our inner state and shift our identification more and more from the small self or false self with its instinctual needs, its entanglements, its contrived dramas uh, and afflictive emotions, and we tune into this different frequency altogether. We start to find our identity less and less in ideology, in denomination or nationality or political affiliation, and we're not buffeted around by the winds of the moment, but are able to dwell more and more in that divine space, that grace-filled gaze. It's this complete shift in perspective. Right. Now, rather than solving every problem, the practice immerses the very mind that perceives and dwells on problems within a divine space saturated by grace. And when we see ourselves unmasked and not only loved, but touch a love at the very center of our being, we start looking for ways not to defend or attack or acquire or hoard, but love. And now that doesn't mean we don't take precautionary measures when necessary, but our inner disposition remains open. And if we feel anxiety, we recognize it, we understand how it affects our thoughts and actions. In our contemplative practice, we relinquish with attention, with diligence. We consent to the presence and action of God within. And if we fail, we return to the sacred word that symbolizes the intent to let go. And if we fail again, we return again, ever so gently inviting that divine presence and perspective. And what tends to happen is this gradual shift into a different space of acceptance of what is on an emotional level. And that is a kind of non-attachment. We still take action in the world and respond skillfully, but without getting overly entangled in the past or future as an emotional preoccupation. And when we notice ourselves getting emotionally entangled in unhealthy thought patterns, we notice, we let go. And this is at least in part what Jesus means by being in the world, but not of the world, which is often narrowly defined as adopting this separate value system. But it's this awareness that allows for a little levity, agency, grace, freedom, even during turbulent times. So I hope you're safe and sound and able to find these moments of rest wherever you are.